welcome to the last of the talks I'm going to be doing on Bruckner's Eighth Symphony. I started with a clip from 1904 of the Cossack Cavalry because um, Bruckner said the beginning of this movement, the fourth movement, the finale, was inspired by having seen the Cossacks when they visited the Austrian Emperor. And uh, one thing I haven't yet said about the symphony is that it is dedicated to the Austrian Emperor. In fact, Bruckner did have support from nobility um, it was just winning over the audiences that he had problems with. Here we are, the finale of the symphony. We've just endured or enjoyed or got through the Adagio, which is, as I've said, a very long movement, nearly half an hour. And you can be forgiven for thinking in the concert hall that maybe now we're just going to have a nice romp to the end of the symphony. And we find out that the last movement lasts about 25 minutes. So it's not much shorter than the Adagio. And um, the shape of this symphony in, in terms of length of movement is quite unusual. The scherzo and the first movement are roughly the same length of each other, roughly 16 minutes, 17 minutes. And then the last two movements are considerably longer. It's an interesting pattern. Beethoven 5, famously, the last movement is much longer than the first three movements. If you take other symphonists like Tchaikovsky, you'll find that the finales are often short in the sort of more showman-like way of presenting material. They just give you something to sort of get your spirits lifted up and get you out of your chair at the end of the concert feeling bucked up and ready to applaud. Bruckner in this movement presents us with another long stretch of music which is um, presents us with challenges because it's possibly the least disciplined in the way that it presents its material. I think by this stage of the experience of listening to the Eighth Symphony we're so used to the amount of time that Bruckner takes to say things and we're so used to the idea that he's going to go in odd directions Rather like taking a distracted child round an art gallery, you know, getting them to focus on one thing. They just, he just goes from one thing to the next to the next, and we just sort of have to go with him. This movement does work to a large extent on a sort of power of reminiscence. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of things that are new, but they sound quite like stuff we've already had. So there are melodic shapes that although they're not exact repetition of melodies that we've already heard, are similar enough to make us feel that we're in the same sort of world, the same sort of country, um, that somehow these things are related. But when you really try to nail things down and put your finger on why these things work together, it's really very difficult. I've done an overview of the movement using the idea that I use for the Adagio of thinking about it in terms of paragraphs. So I think before we get uh, stuck into the score, I'll show you the overview. Well, here we are. Now, fortunately for my powers of um, arithmetic, Bruckner does the whole movement in the same time signature. It's four beats in a bar, so I don't have to start counting beats. There are 747 bars in this movement, <laughs> which is a lot of bars. Although um, the Robert Simpson division of movements into statement, expanded counterstatement and coda hold reasonably true in this movement, it's not as good a description as it has been earlier in the symphony. Because what I find is that in this expanded counterstatement, it's very hard to identify stuff from the first group, second group and third group. We'll see through when we look through the score that there is some repetition, but it's amazing how much of the time you've got music that is not obviously related to anything that you hear in the opening statement. But what we do see here is uh, the same sort of pattern as we had in the Adagio. First paragraph, 68 bars. Second paragraph, similar sort of length. Third paragraph, just a little bit longer. And then we have a little transition period. Now I say little, it's 48 bars, which is, um, you know, about more than two thirds of the stuff that we've already listened to. So that's quite a substantial transition. Then we get into this expanded counterstatement. 
and everything is in the order of two well I'll, I'll start that again the first section is just over twice as long as the first paragraph here the fifth paragraph is enormous I've called it one paragraph because there is not an obvious break um, in this whole section of music there's none of Bruckner's pauses in all of these bars it does have two climactic moments so arguably this is not just one paragraph you might go through it and say well actually this is possibly two paragraphs then we have um, the sixth paragraph which is considerably shorter and then a coda which is of the same order of length as the first paragraph so you can see there's a sort of similarity to the way that the adagio is put together as the other movements do we have um, an awful lot of modulation so the keys that i've put down here at the bottom are uh, are taken from sort of moments of arrival when uh, Bruckner is absolutely in a key for a certain amount of time by no means can we say the first paragraph is in c minor in fact the first note that we hear in this movement is an f sharp <laughs> go figure but when we get to the sort of cadence points or the the held harmonies we find that we're in actually fairly normal tonal regions for a symphony in c minor so the movement starts in C minor. Second subject or second group of themes, second paragraph is one degree flat in um, A flat major and then the third paragraph balances that out by being one degree sharp of C minor so three flats, four flats, two flats in B flat major. Fourth paragraph um, has a climactic moment in the relative major, E flat major this enormous fifth paragraph has two climactic moments one in the tonic major which is of course where we're heading and another one in the relative major sixth paragraph takes us back to c minor and then the coda is a blaze of c major the most radiant c major extraordinarily thrilling ending to the whole symphony so that's a sort of overview which gives us as it were a map to uh, sort of uh, seek our way through this um, forest of notes that we're about to look at. Let's have a quick look at the score. So here we are. This is the really thrilling start to the movement with all these um, grace notes in the strings. Strings playing in unison all the way through. And this enormous brass chorale. Sort of um, padded out a little bit by the woodwind, but you'd be really hard put to tell that they're playing. Don't tell the woodwind that. Okay, so our first paragraph, and as I've said, it starts on F sharp. <laughs> Why not? Um, it does put you in mind of the beginning of the whole symphony, which started on an F. So there is a, a sort of similarity that this is doing something much other than what we'd expect. The last movement ended in D flat. So in terms of our experience in the concert hall, this F sharp you can think of it if the D flat feels dominant then the F sharp feels tonic or if you feel the D flat is tonic then the F sharp feels subdominant and those two pitches are related to each other so it's not a violent shock when you're listening to the piece in in full even so it is a P, uh, symphony in C minor this is the last movement the key signature is C minor and we start on an F sharp it's fantastic fanfare sort of sound that um, John Williams picks up on in some of his Star Wars scores I mean, this sort of the terror of the Empire or something like that this is full of a, a feeling of might this paragraph is in it's got three statements of this sort of fanfare idea the first one moves from F sharp I'll just flick back moves from the F sharp the bass movement which we can see very clearly in the tuba is down in thirds F sharp D D flat B flat down to G flat and then that leads down to E flat and on to D flat so rather long windedly I've just said it goes down in thirds and ends in D flat then we have the phrase repeated again but upper tone um, very Bruckner thing it's basically a sequence so this time it starts not on an F sharp but enharmonically upper tone on A flat same sequence and we end up on E flat 
So we're sort of, you know, having started in quite a foreign place, we're quite quickly back into the sort of area that we'd expect to be in. The third phrase is not a sequential repetition. It's actually different music, but it starts in C minor. So we are home. Then after that enormous um, expression of energy and uh, might, we have a typical Brucknerian diminishing of energy. Uh, first in the forces drop out, there's a diminuendo, and then a period of calmness, of tonal calmness, with the violins on a tonic pedal, the rhythm of the beginning, and this wonderful cadential passage. In the uh, tenor of Wagner Tuba here, we have E naturals, which are sort of foreshadowing the Tiesta Picida that we're going to see just over the page. The um, B flat uh, Wagner tubers are keeping on a subdominant harmony. So essentially, this is a plagal cadence over the over this period here. Um, this little melodic shape that we have in the tenor Wagner tuba is very typical of Bruckner, the diminished fourth third, diminished fifth. If you know the Matet Christus Factus Est, he uses the same thing at the end of that as the same cadence. And so what we have here is subdominant harmony going on to tonic harmony. The tonic is going to be in the major. And at the end of the whole movement, we have essentially a huge plagal cadence when it goes from F major to C major. And then over the page, it all settles down onto C major. The energy dissipates. We have silence. And then we have the second period. Now, this is um, similar in character to the second group in the first movement. You can It's very easy to call this a Gesang's period because um, it's got that same sort of song-like quality. It starts in A-flat. It's rather like the third subject in the Adagio, which, if you remember, always uh, comes in in E-flat and played by the cellos. And that was similarly starts with the descending sixth. da 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 um, that one beautifully performed um, and so you can see this is a very similar shape the descending sixth it's not exactly the same but it's close enough to set up um, a feeling of reminiscence um, that our memory is sort of being engaged and again this comes uh, three times the second time uh, the cellos join in still in a flat so rather like that theme in the Diageo it always comes in in the same key in bar 91 here, we just get the first glimpse of this sort of, uh, I've called it a tread idea. These staccato crotchets are a big feature of the movement, and that's the first little glimpse that we have of them. Letter F here, we have a chorale in the Wagner tubers. Again, that sort of texture is stuff that's familiar to us from what we've just listened to in the Adagio. So again, our memory is being engaged. And this is the third time we have the tune the of the second group and again it's in a flat so i suppose unsurprisingly what we're seeing is that um elements of putting things together or that we have already seen in earlier in the symphony bruckner is doing again and why not um it's it's the language of this piece of music other bits of reminiscence we just have here that semitone is that reminiscent of the Adagio? It's a big part of the Adagio. We've just heard it lots of times. So if we hear a semitone like that, does that spark memory? I think it does. But you get to a point when you're looking at little things like that and you're saying, well, uh, that's like that. And you think, well, is it really? Mm, I don't know. I think in that case it is. And now we get to our third group. And like the first movement, it, again, this is very similar to the music that was at the third group in the first movement. Please do look back at that, this minor third um, woodwind tune over sort of tread-like thing in the strings. In the first movement that was pizzicato, so it's not exactly the same, but this woodwind tune is very similar. And this is where this tread idea is taken up even more. We see a lot of these straight crotchets and then this rhythm dum dee da dee da da dum da da dum dum. That happens an awful lot as well. This section of the piece is, it looks as if there are two lines, but actually the woodwind here is just a reduction of the string line. So it's a little bit of heterophony there from Bruckner. Nice word for you to remember. 
and on we go. The uh, a repetition, rather like he did with the second group, so the same thing again in the same key. It goes in a different direction. Again, we're used to seeing Bruckner doing that by now. And then we have a descending scale, which again is going to remind us of what we've heard in the Adagio. The descending scale is a huge, important part of that movement. Here it is again. The tread sets off again, but this time in D. And we get to our sort of climactic moment um, of this area. So we have the rhythm of the first movement. Dum, da dum, da dum. I'm going to set you see it better over the page. Dum, da dum, da dum, ba da dum. You remember that rhythm from the first page of the whole symphony. So there's a little reminder way back in our memories of music that we've heard now nearly an hour ago. Um, and the, underneath that's so all the strings are playing this sort of tread idea. Crotchets in the cellos and basses and then doubled into quavers by the violins and violas. This sort of open fifth thing is a sort of figure that you see Bruckner using a lot. If you listen to his Te Deum, strings spend an awful lot of that piece basically doing that pattern. And this is the climax of the statement. Now, um, interestingly, he doesn't have a pause here. The music actually keeps moving. There's still harmonic movement going on underneath here and there's still sort of counterpoint. So it's not a, um, a drawing of breath that, as such as we've seen before. And this is why it's a little bit more difficult to say that this is really a transition. Um, there's more going on than normal. Here we have another little bit of music based on the tread idea. And what comes on top of it, this four part horn writing, um, is the rhythm that we've seen before, sort of based on the first subject of the first movement. But this music in its character is entirely new and <laughs> you sort of listen to it and you think well that's very lovely but where did that come from scale idea again and now we are into what i think is the expanded counter statement now i call it this is the counter statement because it starts with the first idea from this movement the first group or the first paragraph but it is piano and instead of being blasted out by the brass um, it's played by three flutes completely different um, in the way in its effect uh, very delicately orchestrated now we have music that is the type of stuff that he does in the Gesangs period but it's not really quite the same as anything we've heard before and then this is a reminiscence of the third group because it's crotchets but instead of being separate bows and rather sort of tread like it's now legato and um, is transformed slightly now then, we have here a combination of material that has already been presented to us. The brass are playing the third phrase of the first paragraph. With the tread idea played by all of the upper woodwind flutes, oboes and clarinets. So essentially what we have there is a sort of um, a two-part counterpoint Slightly more complicated than, than that, obviously, because this is all harmonised. But it's, it's a counterpoint of two elements. Back into sort of more wistful music in the style of the Gesangs period. Sort of um, counterpoint between two lines here. Oboe and second, and, and second firsts playing one thing and the upper first playing another. Then the violas join in down here with the clarinets. That combination of two ideas... There's the sort of tread idea in the violins and the chorale idea in the brass and the bassoons. And the third time they're combined. After a big climax like that, we get what we expect, a sort of um, breathing space. So just a simple repeated chord and triplets and some very slow moving chorale type stuff in the upper strings. And then this moment where they are taken, all the violas and the violins are taken very high and they're just accompanied by these two clarinets. A lot of Bruckner's music is so weighty. Remember, he was an organist, so he's got this feeling for using, as it were, the pedal department. Um, all of that bottom end of the tessitura is taken out and we're just left with brightness, sort of blinding brightness. The contrapuntal section, dotted rhythms that have come from some of the more martial themes, but 
melodic shapes that have come from the Gesangs period. So this is a sort of you know, mishmash of ideas that are, are new. These are new shapes, really, but they also are very reminiscent of stuff that we've already heard. And now we do have a pause here, so that's the end of our fourth paragraph, and the fifth paragraph starts. Now then, we have the scale idea, we have the dum da da dum rhythm that originally was part of the tread, and we have the first group, the sort of Cossack fanfare, back in the horns and the Wagner tubers, but piano with crescendos to forte and dying down again. And some sort of uh, imitation between the violins here. And we have um, the combination, really, of very slow moving material, things that is going in tied semi briefs against these quicker crotchets and quavers. So it's like two time dimensions coexisting. I think dimensions is the right word. On that goes, sorry, I'm having to flick through this because there's so many pages of it. Then here we have the uh, grace note figure from the beginning, the sort of galloping figure, but pianissimo, but it's sort of beginning to put energy back into the music. I think one of the things that happens in this movement or one of the ways to think about it, is it starts with this colossal injection of energy that dissipates. And then for the rest of the movement, Bruckner is trying to put that energy back in. And there are moments when it gets going again and it relaxes and it gets going again, it relaxes until at the end, this whole colossal machine of music, this whole colossal iceberg, all those big things that I've mentioned before gets moving again in its sort of full glory. Anyway, here we have an injection of rhythmic energy. And then we have you know, just a burst of energy. Um, material from the opening, full orchestra, glorious. And I should point out that we're back on the F sharp. So yes, at this point, this is a restatement of the opening and we're back where we started on the F sharp. Great fun, great energy. Well done, Anton. Okay, and then we get to a climactic point, <laughs> orchestra, triple F, and we are in A flat. We've got our fanfares in the trumpets, and it's all glorious, and you all feel fantastic that you're alive. Let's just go back over the keys that are going on here. We've got a lot of the roots moving now by minor thirds. Um, some of them are in harmonic, so we start on A flat. We move up to B, and harmonically that's C flat, so minor third up. We move up with minor third onto D. We move up, oh no, where's the F? There's the F, and then we move on to A, and then we're in C major. So significant steps up to the goal of the whole symphony. Of course, this isn't the end. We're only at bar 500. <laughs> only 250 or so to go. And then... After that, down to these little semitone dotted figures, again slightly reminiscent of the first movement. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. And that becomes, that's a chromatic sequence, such as we have seen quite frequently by now. Another build up. And here we get to E flat major. And it's, uh, it's like all these important keys are having their moment in the sun. And it, so at this point, Bruckner's saying, well, here's E flat. Isn't E flat great? Let's have a listen to some E flats. And so we do. We listen to some E flat. And it is great. And we sort of feel very grateful for that. But it dies away because although E flat's great, it's not where we really want to be. And we have another chromatic ascent here. Look at the bass part on every two bars. It's going up in semitones. Then the whole orchestra is going up. And, I, and then we get to this very dissonant chord. Three, four Fs again. And it's a half diminished seventh. And that's held for four bars. And it carries on in the horns. And the horns here are playing the rhythm that reminds us of the first movement. So that harmonic energy is sort of dissolved by dynamics going and then by settling into a slightly unexpected key except it's expected in that here is our second group theme and it's in a flat when we hear this tune it's a flat a flat there here it is again a flat 
on it goes and we have a definite pause that is the end of the fifth paragraph and so we're into the sixth paragraph pizzicato is that reminiscent of the first movement because it's pizzicato i don't know chorale idea though um, in the Wagner Chibas, again a reminiscence of sounds that we've heard a fair bit. Now we have the third group with a, a sort of in a contrapuntal setting. I have read one analysis that calls this a fugue, and why not? It's definitely, controver uh, definitely contrapuntal, and that goes on for some time. Remember that Bruckner was a professor of counterpoint, he can do this stuff in his sleep. On it goes, and then we uh, We've had another build-up all the way through that contrapuntal section. We have a 32-bar dominant pedal starting here. Timps, double basses. And this is one of these things where the it sort of builds up. Let's just flick back. That was fortissimo. And then it just loses dynamic energy and the whole thing tails off. We have a diminution of dum ba da dum be da dum dee da dum Diminution, and interestingly, the this although the notes are speeding up, it's the um, because they're speeding up, they're coming smaller. Uh, it's like things breaking up. Now sometimes we uh, we use uh, um, shortening note values like that to increase excitement, but he's doing the opposite here. He's using the shortening note values to just let tension slip away. That sort of is summed up in a little bit of a chorale period here in the strings and then we have another significant bit of silence just these pulses on the timps completely silent bar and this is the coda and from here we have our 60 something bar um, work towards c major so it starts in c minor these beautifully hushed um, quaver figures and this is from the first group repetition modulation go to b flat minor here d minor here so again roots thirds then into a minor so that's not quite the same pattern then we get the horns sounding out the music that we heard in the scherzo and we're in f major at this stage now We've already heard in this movement that he refers back to stuff we've heard in the first movement. He refers back to stuff that we've heard in the Dajo, and now he's referring to the Scherzo. So there's a feeling that he's also using the fourth movement to tie all the ends together. And we'll see in a few pages that he does this in a, in a moment of... <laughs> it's just fantastic. Uh, it looks so obvious when, it, when you see it on the page, but to think of it... And to do it so successfully, that takes quite a bit of genius. Now then, this chord here is just wonderful. And it, it's almost like that fantastic dissonant chord in the Eroica. Let's just see where we've come from. So I said we were in F major. Nice bright key. F major, F major, F major. All of that page is F major. Now, the bass here goes from F up to D. The chord here is essentially B flat in first inversion, but look how many E naturals there are in the violins, up in the woodwinds there, and that's a glorious, glorious dissonance. Then in one quaver, by just changing the B flat by a semitone, semitones again, onto B natural, by moving the E up to an F, that chord becomes dominant type harmony in C. In fact, it's a chord of 7B. And there we are. Bang! We're in C major. I think I'm going to indulge myself and just play you those three chords on my piano. This means that I'm now going to disappear and you'll hear the piano and then I'll come back. is tremendously satisfying and I recommend that you all do it <laughs> it's just great harmony and then from this point on where are we now let's find if we can see if we can find a bar number bar 725 to the end C major and then over the page here the fanfares that we've heard 
um, the sort of Cossack music. And this is the moment. In the trombones here, we have music from the first movement. Dum, da dum, da dum, da da dum. Trumpets, the theme from the scherzo. Dum, bum, 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 bum. The Wagner tubers here are playing the rhythm of the fourth movement. Ta da! Ta da! And the horns here are playing the adagio, first subject. And it all plays together and it's all put into C major. It's fantastic. How much of that do you realise when you listen to it? I don't know. If you've got brilliant ears, you might pick up on all that. What you get is um, this uh, you, this wonderful blaze of C major. You will certainly pick up on some of the uh, melodies. I think possibly the one that comes most to your ear straight away is the trumpets. And you might well pick up on the trom uh, trombones as well. But even if that is music that is only really appreciable by looking at the page, um, it's amazing on the page. And if we can't hear it all, we can still get the excitement of what is going on here. It's the most amazing bit of music. And that takes us home to the final. And it's extraordinary how abrupt the ending feels after the slowness of what has gone before it. As I say, this chord of C major has been held out now for a long, long time. But even at the end, when we get to dum, ba da dum, it's, um, it doesn't feel like it's outstayed its welcome. Um, it's a brilliantly judged end to the movement. There we are. That's the finale from Bruckner 8. We've come to the end of it. It's quite a funny feeling. Um, I'm rather sorry to come to the end of this piece because it is. I just find it so overwhelming. And there is uh, uh, a feeling that whatever I've said is really quite inadequate to cover what Bruckner has done in this piece. I've really only scratched the surface. But it's been a pleasure for me to look at it in more detail, to try and understand how this fantastic music is put together. At the end of the day, what really matters is our personal reaction to the sounds as they go past. Um, and there's such a wealth of material here, um, such a vast range of expression from the from the biggest climaxes imaginable to the, the quietest, most delicate, um, fragile piece of music. Uh, he does throw it all in and somehow it makes sense. Um, and it says something to us about existence and life, which nobody else says in quite the same way. Um, it's very humbling, wonderful piece. To finish with, I'd like to just play the coda of the last movement. Um, because it's just a wonderful piece of music and uh, Bruckner is going to be able to sum up all of this, all of these thoughts in a way that I'm, I'm absolutely inadequate to. So I think we should just hand it over to Bruckner. Enjoy. Thank you. 